the bushwhacks were some of uh, the worst days I've ever had in the mountains, or life, really. Whereas Panzer Mountain is totally opposite. It's a mountain on top of a crater. I think the weather challenges on this incident were particularly difficult. It was really the development of New York State. Catskills were responsible. Now you're listening to Inside the Line, the Catskill Mountains Podcast. All right, uh, Happy New Year, Matt. How you doing, sir? Uh, doing well. Good to be here, Stash. Happy New Year. Yeah, good to have you back once again. I always like to have you, Matt. You're very well into the Catskills. You have a great information in the Catskills, so I like to bring you on. Uh, especially when we're talking about 2023, when you got a recap, uh, we're going to be doing a recap tonight with Matt Smith, uh, not just uh, what is he involved with, with the trail crew, but uh, also different stuff and events that have in the Catskill. So welcome back, Matt. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, the Catskills are a special place and definitely have a special place in my heart. So I love coming on your show, talking about them and getting the word out about the cool stuff that's going on. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Speaking of crazy. Uh, we got a winter storm predicted this Saturday and a Sunday. So somewhat, so far, so far, that's what I've heard. I saw like something like seven inches, possibly. Um, which so is far, a nice so storm. far. Yeah. Well, as long as it doesn't follow it up with a rainstorm, that would be great. Um. Yeah. Yeah. We'll 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 chat about that a little bit later with the forecast. But that's that's awesome. So, Matt, I was wondering if you were familiar with this. Apparently, more people have summited Mount Everest than completed the 3500 Club. Is that new to you? Wow. That is kind of surprising because there's probably, what, around 5,000? We're probably coming up on 5,000 people from the 3500 Club. Actually, we're at 4,600. Okay. So maybe 5,000 by the end of the year. If things yeah, maybe. Going at the same pace. And so more than 5,000 people have climbed... Everest or somewhere around there, huh? Over 6,000 people have climbed Mount Everest. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, and it's certainly a lot more difficult to get to the Himalayas and get a permit and do all that stuff. Correct. <laughs> and spend money on that. Um, you know, I, I I, don't understand. I do understand. I don't. I mean, it's, it's I think it's a little bit more of course riskier and stuff like that but it's just it doesn't it doesn't like it doesn't excite me that that i would want to go risk my life climbing the highest peak in the, in the world and just to say that i did it especially with like sherpas and stuff like that doing most of the work for me well i think it's an interesting impulse to climb the highest thing right and you know marcy in new york is maybe an example um and, you know, I think it's, it's superlatives uh, really excite people, like the most of anything, like the fastest known time, right? You've uh, got some of those on your list of things to talk about today. And, like, that's just another example of people like, well, I want to be the fastest. I want to be the best. And I think Everest kind of represents that um, achieving the ultimate. And, you know, it's a, sort of one of those life uh, achievements that people will either you know brag about or will define them in some way sort of they're hoping it to transform themselves maybe or it's just like another you know sort of checkbox like you know i've been to um bali and i've been to everest or you know whatever you know checklist you've got of like extreme things or beautiful things that you want to do um, yeah. maybe it's just sort of that kind of impulse but yeah and it, Good way to say about it. ecological impact but i mean have you seen the pictures of Everest space camp oh uh, yeah it's horrible yeah, and, and just the lines of people going up and, um, you know, just the, uh, I think last year might have been the uh, most deaths on Everest. Uh, based oh, really? On the number of people died. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's a correct statistic, but but I do recall hearing one of, one of the most recent years was yeah. the most deadly on record. And I think it's just more and more people showing up, um, less experienced people showing up. It's not necessarily just mountaineers now. It's guys on Correct. Wall Street who can pay for the ticket and do some training in a gym, get in shape, you know, and like you said, have the Sherpas and the bottle of oxygen getting them to the top. Correct. And, you know, you know, well, well said, Matt, that, you know, it's the exhilaration of 
saying that you did it or that I did that and accomplishment, stuff like that. But, you know, we, we have awesome mountains in our backyard and, you know, all over, even the East coast, 6,000 foot mountains that could, you know, Mount, Mount Washington could possibly take your life with extreme weather or even here, yeah. you know, Denali, stuff like that. But just right. looking at, like you said, the base camp and those lines going up like the Hillary step, stuff like that, where, you know, you pass a dead person on your left and on your right. That's just, that's just scares the shit out of me. No way. Yeah. Well, and I think maybe that's part of what people like too. It's like the, the potential that you could die makes it that much more exciting. Like it's, you know, that <laughs> ultimate risk. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm one of those guys that gets a very, very uh, crazy about different weather, like, you know, extreme weather, but I wouldn't go that far to say like, huh, I could fall off this 27,000 foot mountain and possibly die. Or, you know, there might be a, you know, avalanche or stuff like that. Just, it just doesn't appeal to me. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I think you, you maybe are just a more mellow kind of dude who's just <laughs> looking for an easy going hike in the woods and, you know, just some a little bit of uh, a type two adventure, you know, maybe you get lost on a bushwhack or something like is the most extreme thing. And, and you know, I think that's good for most people. And the cat stills have a lot of that. So I wonder as, as time goes on, if there will be more 35ers than Everest climbers, like there'll, there'll be a point where maybe it gets more popular and more easy to climb the 35 peaks than it is to even get a permit for Everest. I've heard that there's, they're talking about like shutting it down and having less access to the mountain because I guess now the Chinese have more control over certain aspects of, of access and they're not letting anybody in from certain sides of the mountain. So it actually has decreased traffic overall, but it oh. has put more pressure on, on the Southern routes to you know put more and more people there. Yeah, definitely seeing that all over the world the increased amount of hikers and stuff like that. I mean, a good thing and a bad thing, mm -hmm. double-edged sword. Um, you know, yeah, there's, but, there's too many people, but there's never too many hikers, right? Exactly. If, if everybody was a hiker, I think the world would probably be a better place. Cause there'd be, you know, more investment in hiking trails and, you know, more people doing the volunteer work and all the good stuff that needs to happen. Humble people, more humble people. Yeah. That's a good, good perspective talking about we're, we're, we're talking about like the search and rescue kind of stuff you know with, with everest and stuff so this just happened uh you know two days ago i got this uh not it's local search and rescue news and this was a hiker rescued after falling down adirondack mountain peak on a wet wintry night so this was my matt i know you're familiar with the adirondacks and a uh, i'm working on my 46 now Okay, I thought you did. Oh, yeah, you did. You do the the one fifteen, right? No, I'm, I'm working on my 115, the 46 is the last thing I need to do. I got my 67, I got my New England 67, and now I'm working on that. The Adirondacks okay. to close it up. So, have you done uh South Dix Mountain yet? Have you done Dix Range? I haven't. That's on my list to do later this month, actually. Okay, so maybe I'll uh, learn a lesson from this and I won't fall down where this guy did. Yeah, this person apparently fell like 70 feet uh 45 mile per hour winds and the person said i thought i might have frozen to death if there wasn't for the rangers uh 46 year old guy uh right after christmas or 46 year old so day after when she lost her footing oh okay sorry so 46 year old woman named hope lloyd lost her footing around 5 30 p.m so it's up on the top of the mountain at 5 30 p.m so in the dark near the top of south dicks mountain and they skidded several hundred feet over the steep snow and uh luckily the rangers got a call from her and they got a ping and they luckily found her right on the side of the mountain not too far from the trail so great job by the rangers of course in their adirondack high peaks they have a tough job doing their crazy weather stuff like that um low 30s yeah. and uh they said they found lloyd basically with on the verge of hypothermia mild hypothermia wet cold so they got him to the trail they got lloyd uh to the trail they got her to the trail fixed her up some hot warm food got her some some protein stuff like that and then they reached their vehicle at 6 30 a.m a.m so that was a 12, 12 hour extraction yes insane um they said they walked out by foot so 
So let me ask, like, do they know why she was up on the mountain at 530? Was she at the end of a long day and like just, you know, just tired or was she just hiking like a night hike or something like that, doing like one of those extreme night hikes? So Hope was an experienced 48 sixer uh, that has hiked the 46 twice. So very experienced. Knew kind of what what the, she was doing, but you know she, she was out there after dark on purpose, and she was solo. Yes, um, had a headlamp. Um, yeah. just lost her footing, and then all of a sudden, you know, just fell into that situation of maybe yeah. just like an accident. Well, sure, but you, you used the term humble a little while ago, and I I don't know whether or not like um, heading out into a Adirondack wilderness by yourself in the middle of the night speaks of any kind of humility or humbleness or like respect for the uh, wilderness. It just strikes me as being hubris and thinking that you got one over on the mountain. And, and in this case, the mountain got her. And, and I think that's, you know, when we're talking about Everest, she was probably looking for an adventure and she got yeah. what she was looking for. And the Rangers paid the price of 12 hours in the woods to help her have a little bit extra fun in the mountain. So yeah. good for her for getting out alive and hope she learned a lesson and never does that kind of thing again and puts anybody else's lives at risk. Cause it, it strikes me as being a responsible behavior on her part. And she's lucky she had a cell phone. Correct. Correct. And I, you know, the, the weather they said was, uh, well, what they called hypothermia weather, but what I call it like low forties, rain, wind, stuff like that. I do not, you know, I might want to summit a mountain or, or get out, but in, in that kind of weather, I'm just like, hell no. It's yeah. just mis miserable time. Absolutely. That's that's like, yeah, it's super high risk. And um, that, that time when you just can't stay dry and you can't get warm is, is really the worst. Um, I've been out like that. I think I maybe told you the story when uh, my, my buddy Jim Griffiths broke his leg on the top of the slide. And it was the same thing. It was 40 yep. degrees and raining. And it was the worst possible situation. I mean, he was in hypothermia the same way that, that she was. And it's, it's you know, a deadly situation. So, um, uh, you know, I... I'm shocked that there was cell reception where she was. I mean, that's a blessing. That's like, you know, exactly uh, shock to me, you know, cause I've been up through Keene Valley and barely gotten any kind of reception, let alone, you know, past the trailheads. Exactly. So uh, kudos to the Rangers. Uh, thank yeah. you once again for doing what you do. Hopefully some of them listen to this and they get the, the smile on their face that you guys are just beyond what we, we think you are and your heroes basically. So, once again. Yeah, that is it's truly amazing. I mean, just imagine that. Like you you just finish your work day and you get a call like, hey, you gotta go spend twelve hours in the woods tonight and yeah. you do it and, and you don't fall asleep and you don't drop the ball and, and you get them out alive because you know that like those people are counting on you. It's like that type of dedication. Um they don't get paid enough. I mean, it's they're correct. Doing correct doing work. Yeah. So once again, uh that kind of weather, uh, you know, take your Take your, your caution on, on doing that. It's, it's not really worth it from my experiences and stuff like that, you know, being with search and rescue. And as you see from these experiences that we, we have on online and in the internet, it's not really worth it just to summit a mountain or just to, to get out. If you're going to get out, get out your local flat trail. Uh, but still, it's just, it's just not the type of weather to get worth to get out there. So also. Big, huge congratulations to my friend, Darren White. He's a supporter of the show. Uh, he is, like I said, we're actually 4367. He got his number this weekend. So congratulations, Darren, on finishing your 3500. I was there with him on Black Mountain. So big congratulations to Darren on finishing your Catskills 3500. All right. Congratulations, Darren. Welcome to the club. Yeah. Welcome to the club, Darren. Really appreciate it. So uh, thank you, monthly supporters. Uh, Darren White, once again, congratulations. Welcome to the club. Vicky Ferrara, John Comiskey, Jim C., Michael Bonger, David Mead, you, Matt Smith, and Denise Weiss. Thank you very much for supporting the show. Also, have you ever wanted to learn more about hiking or backpacking or even brush up on some of your old skills in the backcountry? Check out Trailbound Project, a hiking and backpacking school. Scott and Joe from the New Jersey Search and Rescue team have the amazing backgrounds in Wilderness First Aid, Wilderness First Recovery, and the Mountain Rescue Association and are here for, to help you to learn old and new skills of hiking and backpacking. They teach anything from first aid, map and compass, and many other skills that could help you and others while out on the trail. Check them out on their so their me check them out on their website and social media platforms. They are doing winter survival stuff this year so far, the first couple months. Check them out, book them when they when you can. 
Also, check out Outdoor Chronicles Photography. Molly from Outdoor Chronicles Photography specializes in adventure elopement and adventure couple photography in the Catskills, Adirondack, and White Mountains. She is also an officiant for getting married, but she is a licensed guide, but she is also a story maker. Molly won't just give you photos. She'll give you memories that will last forever. Don't hesitate to get a hold of Molly on all platforms. So what are you having to drink tonight? Matt, you having anything? Oh, I'm drinking my old uh, probiotic lemonade from Kavita. Delicious. Oh, nice. Refreshing. Refreshing, nutritious, and healthy. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, maybe not so nutritious. I don't think there's much in there besides um, bacteria and oh. lemon flavor. But yeah, I guess it's I mean, good. Okay. I mean, I mean, at first it sounded healthy, I guess. <laughs> it it um, settles I'm, my stomach, yeah. Yeah, I'm having the complete opposite. I'm having, uh, it's been a busy day, so I'm having a quick rum and coke, like always. Uh, but it's been a busy day. So, um, also wanted to th thank uh, Brian for his three hard ciders. His Instagram name is Bry Anew35. So check him out. He says, always enjoy the podcast, love the history, variety of guests, and perspectives. It has served as an inspiration for several hike adventures. We want Brian and Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And I'm glad, you know, we can be an inspiration on the, on the show. I try my hardest. Also, thank you, Matt, who is on the show tonight for 20 hard ciders. He said it's the best podcast hiking in the cats, best <laughs> podcast about hiking in the Catskills ever. And there's got to be, I, I, I replied to him saying there's got to be at least five or six more better than mine. I, if you can recommend them, maybe I'll check them out, but uh, oh. I'm, I'm sticking with you for now, Stash. Okay, there's got to be something about. Um, also, uh, thank you, Danny, or uh, Mighty Mischievous. Uh, congratulations on being the first to summit Balsam Cap Lone and Rocky in 2024. Uh, he tagged me in one of his photos on Instagram, and I really appreciate it. Anybody wants to tag me or something, I'll give you a mention on the podcast. Uh, great job of you know being safe and any perspective of just hiking the Catskills. And Danny likes to uh, volunteer a lot. And he is a great guy. So check him out on Instagram, Mighty Mischievous on Instagram. So really cool stuff. Once again, if you complete your 3,500 or uh, just want to uh, mention, just tag me in an Instagram photo or uh, a Facebook photo and I'll throw you in on the podcast. So Matt, you've been out previously uh, on some hikes that you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, I've done some hikes lately, uh, scouting out trails and and doing some uh, maintenance. So nice hiking around plateau mountain and those areas i did one hike recently it's a bushwhack that um, a lot of people know about you might have been there there's a shoulder of panther mountain that's got an open meadow with a big boulder in it that overlooks uh the the burrows range and it's kind of an amazing magical place and if you know about it know how to get there it's it's kind of incredible um there's basically an old woods road or a series of woods roads that can get you pretty close to it and then you know, some minor herd paths that, that will get you up there. A lot of bear activity up there because it's, you know, close to Woodland Valley. So the bears will kind of, uh, you know, stay up on the ridge away from the, the campground and, and prowl around up there. I was up there maybe a couple of years ago and a friend of mine found a big antler from from a deer that had shed. It was like, I think it probably would have been a 10 pointer. He said five, five points wow. on that one antler. So nice, nice big one. So really wild and beautiful area. And, and these meadows just have like incredible views and the rocks, the big giant boulders you can climb on top of um, have like weird carvings on them, like like almost like astrological um, geometric carvings um, with letters and symbols on them that kind of look old. They're, you know, grown over. I wouldn't say they're ancient, but um, kind of mysterious and kind of cool. So it's an interesting place. Do you know the place I'm talking about um, with, the, with those open meadows overlooking the Bros range on, on the shoulder of Panther? I, I think we call it Catskill Henge. Have you heard of that? No, I haven't. Is that where you're talking about? Does it have the uh, kind of like the sundial in the middle? Not that I'm aware of. I, I Ooh, don't. Ooh, this might be a new one to me. Southern part of uh, Panther? Uh, it's. Mm, no, yeah, I guess it is the southern part of Panther, like not yeah, far you're... from Giant Ledge, but, but you're pretty far down the ridge from Panther at that point you know you're um there's a place called beach flats i think it's called on maps if you look at old maps the down the shoulder of of um panther mountain not fork ridge but but um 
north of Fork Ridge, there's an area that's called Beach Flats. Oh, I know where you're talking about. Yes, definitely. Um, yes, it's not. It's actually not to the the south. He's actually you're you're actually talking to the east of the summit. I I know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have my map with me, and I'm a little bit. Um... No, I think I think there there's a certain part on there that uh, we we call. I know what you're the boulders and stuff like that, but there's a certain part that you might have missed that we called we called Catskill Hinge, where they have a, like a setup almost like Stonehenge, and there's a sundial in the middle. We've always been trying to look to see if that was kind of like an an Indian setup or or not. So I, I've I've always looked into that. All right. Well, that's something that I don't, I might have missed that at the, if it's the same area that we're talking about, I didn't see anything that resembled a sundial. So now it's a reason for me to go back again, check it out. Exactly. I, to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, we'll have to, yeah. Definitely an awesome spot. Once again, like <sighs> this is, this is this, this public land. So, you know, I'm not encouraged. If you know what you're doing, definitely explore the cat skills because 90, Five percent of the time, people have already been there. Most likely, hunters or you know, just explorers like Matt or me or John Fellows, James Hobson, the Ralph Rondack, you know, all those those guys have probably already been there. And if you know what you're doing, you can explore anywhere and return back home safely. This is not the crazy Adirondacks where you're you know, 16 miles from a a road or something like that. You can always find safety. Pretty mellow bushwax. Um by all accounts but yeah you can still get yourself into trouble like when i was up there and there was that much bear activity i mean i was like walking around and there was just like crisscross bear tracks everywhere wow. like fresh ones and so you know i was on edge a little bit because i'm a dog with me and bears don't like dogs so um, they say most bear attacks are caused or precipitated by a dog in some way so um yeah it kind of got me on edge a little bit again that kind of that nervous feeling that kind of makes it a little exciting when you're in the woods but like not so much that you think you're going to get you know blown off the mountain or anything like that or attacked by a <laughs> there. Uh, but Matt, another, i like, forgot I, I, I forgot the the name of your dog again oh mia is my dog yeah, yeah. yes yeah. i knew it oh excellent good uh She's yes go dog. go on with about your uh your second hike sorry oh yeah so there's another hike um that i didn't this is again I'm not going to get too much into exactly where it is on the map, but a recent land acquisition by the Open Space Institute in the Southern Catskills near Shokin Reservoir has some of the most amazing terrain in the Catskills. And it's one of those hidden gems that they're going to build a trail there within the next five to 10 years. Now that it's so the Open Space Institute purchased it, they're going to transfer it to the state. And when that happens, then they're going to build trails there and maybe take some of the roads and trails that already uh, are in this area and kind of uh, turn them into official trails. And it, you may have heard of like Wagon Wheel Gap, um, which is an area um, near Shokin High Point. And that area is just absolutely stunning. Ecologically, some of the most unique areas in the Catskill with pitch pine and red pine growing on, on cliff sides, along with some unique plant communities that, that you don't find many other places. So really kind of special. You know, the state's really going to have to be very uh, smart about how they provide yeah. access to that area so that they don't end up, you know, potentially ruining some of those areas. Cause you know, it's kind of one of those like perfect spots where if it's left unattended, it could end up being one of those camping spots that gets ruined and, you know, you just have abuse and overuse and it just gets trampled down. And, you know, some of those um, rare plant communities could just be destroyed. Um, Cause people don't necessarily recognize a rare plant. Like it's just something green on the ground and they'll just set up their tent. And they don't really worry about it. And you know, it could have you know pretty big impacts to the long-term health of those communities. Correct. Yes. And that is definitely an amazing spot. Uh, we're talking about an amazing place of geological history with the ice age yeah. and stuff. Uh, if you, if you ever have it, you'll, 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 if you read, uh, Robert Titus's book, uh, Catskills in the Ice Age or Hudson Valley in the Ice Age, who will explain that area that Matt is talking about. And that is pretty cool that they they purchased that whole area. I didn't know they purchased that area. Down. Yeah, there was, I think, about a thousand acres that was purchased from the Gold family um, who owned all of that track for, for a number of years and maintained it as, you know, an open, wild area. There's some old quarries back there, but um, 
yeah, very wild, very uh, kind of cool area to, to explore. Awesome area. And uh, that, that's, uh, you know, one of the places I, I like to talk about over there is the Ashokan High Point, And that has amazing views. And now I think they recently cut some views up there and uh, you go over the oh. knob. The knob. Did they, they, views. Cut, they cut views up there? I thought they cut a view towards the southeast. I thought so they from did. From the actual summit? I think so. You say they did it. Like, do you think the DEC officially went up and cut that view? I think that was one of the places that they. I'm, I'm, I haven't been there in a while, but um, I'm pretty sure that's one of the places that they recently did cut that they got approved to do that. Okay. So they added in some kind of a unit management plan to open up yeah. that view. Um, huh. Because the that's, Kana- that's Kanape part, is so right? popular. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it would probably be even more popular if those trails were well maintained and. and you know, built up a little bit more. It's kind of a rough area. Definitely is a rough area, but it's a beautiful hike. I got to admit, it's a fun hike. A lot of history. Well, well that view, I mean, I, I've been hiking up there for 40 years. I mean, my, my, my buddy, Reed Anthony, grew up at the base of that mountain in Sampsonville, and I would hang out at his house, and we would hike up from the Sampsonville side, which was, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember, like Ralph Vetter Road or something like that is um, this little dead end that he lived on. And we would just hike to the end of the road and then follow it up. And, it, and just the old berry trail led right up to the notch. And then we would hike to the summit from there. So I had kind of like a different perspective of the mountain as a kid. And, and when I um, started climbing it, when I was older from the Canape side, I first I didn't even recognize it as the same mountain. And once I got to the top, I'm like, oh, wait a minute, this is where I used to play as a kid. So um, nice. Yeah, it's a great yeah. area. Really. Yeah. Phenomenal. I would I would suggest anybody, you know, if you're looking for different adventures, go down to the Canape area, the Canape Brook, and check out Ashokan High Point, because definitely got a lot of history, especially if you uh, look off to your left and right a lot uh, on the way up. It's got some yeah. cool stuff. Well, does it have uh, rock uh, cairns in that area? Is there a, a field of cairns on the way up? Uh, indeed it does. Off, off when you're going up towards your left, if you look once in a while, you'll see those big supposedly ancient indian uh native american rock cairns uh scattered all about and uh you know there's times of what when i really want to believe that's true but then there's times when you when you are talked to by by locals and stuff saying hey you know this rock wall didn't stand up for 60 years how is this ancient thing of over a thousand years still standing up so it's it's tough to it's it's a back and forth topic basically i think there's a lot of really good stories and no legitimate archaeological work done to show what's going on with those piles of stone and i think if they really were that important there'd probably be some true peer-reviewed archaeological papers or books written about them the the book i have uh written by um oh gosh just what is the name i'm gonna look on my bookshelf over here to see if i can find the book was it Secrets in Stone? Is that the yeah Spirits yes. in Stone by um, Kreisberg, right? Glenn Kreisberg. Yeah, it's just a hilarious book because it's just like it's just made up stuff. I mean, it's like totally made up, and there's things that are like demonstrably false in that book. Like he quotes some the carving on on the rock on top of uh, Plateau Mountain as if it were some like ancient Viking script. Turns out it's like the lyrics from a Latvian folk song from the 1970s. <laughs> so it's like it's just complete bunk man but it's fun it's like and and if you want to just have a you know a walk in the woods and tell some good stories like campfire stories right it doesn't need to be true to be interesting and fun but when it starts to try to pretend to be archaeological and and like semi-serious it's like pseudoscience it's like you know not necessarily real but but who knows i mean uh, maybe he's onto something and um, i'm no archaeological expert myself but um i have made some piles of rocks in the woods (laughs) over the years and you know uh, leave no trace matt what the heck well i am i'm a, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a air builder for at the, the trail crew so yeah it's true true so yeah, there you go but you know um did i tell you about the time that i saw a ufo on top of shokin high point not at all this was uh, i was probably in my early 20s and I recently recollected this story with a friend of mine and I started telling the story and he started telling me the same story right back because he remembered it the same exact way that I did, which then validated my memory. Like I, I actually do remember this event exactly how it happened. Cause you know, it, 
it, he and I remember it the same. And I don't know if that's, uh, you know, we're just both crazy in the same way, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but but um, the story goes that we were camping on the field on top of Ashokan High Point. And this was early 1990s, so quite a few years ago. And there was um, a, a, a bigger field back then. Uh, you know, it was not nearly as grown over. And you could see the whole burrows range really pretty clearly from, from the backside. And there was a big fire ring up near the tree line. And we just settled in for the night and we had a fire burning. And, you know, the sun had set and it was at twilight time, that long extended twilight of summer when, you know, it's kind of like that, that, that dark sky. And we saw what we thought were the first stars of the night over the horizon. And then we realized, well, those are much brighter than any stars we've seen. And they're not where we would normally see them. Maybe they're not stars. Maybe they're like uh, planes or something. But then they got bigger and then they moved. And then we're like, well, then they're planes or something, but they weren't making any noise. And so there are these two lights kind of hovering over the horizon and they were clearly like, like vibrating or changing in some way, like oscillating, like they were, they weren't big lights. I mean, they still looked like maybe like the size of a big star or a planet. Um, and then at a certain point, one of them just shot off to the left over the horizon and was gone, like just moved like faster than what we had ever seen. And about two seconds later, the other one did the same thing, but shot right over our heads. Just shoot. And go. Wow. No sound, no like boom, no like, you know, sonic boom or anything from, from anything that would have suggested it was, it was a plane. And that was it. Like we never saw anything for the rest of the night, but I say it was a UFO because it was an unidentified flying object. I have no idea what it was. And it could yeah. have been some experimental aircraft or like, a, um, you know, could have been maybe the wind blowing the sound of a helicopter in a different direction. So we didn't actually hear it, but it was unsettling. And it was one of those things where you, I was left with this feeling. I, I had no idea what had just happened. Like, and I didn't have a clear explanation and I'm a pretty rational guy who is, you know, grounded in very concrete things and don't like things that don't have clear explanations. And, you know, to this day, I still have no, explanation why that happened or what it could have been but interesting pretty, yeah now i think there's a book um i think whitley Whit, whitney stribler or striber um he wrote a book um communion i think it is and somebody on your audience will probably fact check and figure out the right name of that book <laughs> but it's um it was about alien abductions in the southern catskills in the 1970s and 80s and some of the descriptions of the sightings of, of craft were, were similar to what we had seen. So um, so maybe um, I'll have to dig out that book at some time and maybe in these long winter nights, spend a little time reading some spooky stories about UFOs and the Catskills. What was that that uh, book called? If you... I thought it was Communion, um, but right. I could be I will... mistaken about that. I'll check it out, it. and maybe they get a true story. Mm, interesting. I'm gonna have to look look this up. So excellent. Thank you, Matt. Uh, definitely looked at some of that stuff up. Once again, get to a Shokin High Point, great spot. So this weekend, uh, this this Tuesday. So Sunday, I went to Blackhead Mountain, and uh, I celebrated my friend Darren White's and Alex's white, his son, their finish on Blackhead Mountain. Beautiful conditions. About you know. 30 degrees at the bottom and, you know, 20 to 15 degrees at the top, one or two inches of snow, you spikes probably three quarters of the way up. Nice. Uh, when it started getting steep on the, the east side, we did the full loop. We went down to, there was no views. We went down to Camp Steel, a little bit below Camp Steel, try to get a view, nothing. Went over to the western side, you know, overlooking Blackhead and, or Black Dome and the the Indian head range and uh, overlooking Hunter and stuff. We got a little tiny bit of a view and then uh, we were just like, okay, you know, we're getting a little cold. Let's keep moving, move down. And then all of a sudden it started to clear up a little bit and we could have got a view, but, yeah. <laughs> but the conditions were great. Beautiful day for a finish. Darren and his uh, son, Alex said that they couldn't ask for better conditions. They loved it. And, of course, you know, congratulations on your finish. It was a great time, a lot of talking, a lot of 
you know, just uh, chatting about previous experiences in the Catskills. Great, fantastic time of, uh, and then congratulations to Darren on uh, Darren on your finish for the thirty five hundred. Welcome to the club. And he Darren volunteers and and such, and he listens to the show. He supports the show, so I greatly appreciate Darren. And I was like, dude, I'm gonna. I told him one hundred percent. I will be there for for you on that, no doubt. Nice. So, How long has he been working on his thirty five? He said about two years. So oh, that's pretty quick. He didn't, he, yeah, he didn't uh, hesitate. He lives in Binghamton. So that's a little bit further of a drive uh, yeah. for him, especially on the Eastern sides of, uh, of the Catskill. So he's still kicked yeah. ass. And once again, he's volunteering. So I support that 100%. So he, that's he's awesome. volunteering. I think he does the uh, North mountain to South mountain trail over there on the escarpment. So he does Oh yeah, pretty good area. So that was Sunday. So Tuesday, I went with my wife and we did Bramley Mountain up in Delhi. Absolutely phenomenal place. Uh, I've been there several, several times before. Uh, they recently had start clear cutting the top for the the new fire tower that's going to go in. And to be honest, I am going to think this is going to be one of the grandest views in the Catskills. I mean, it's outside of the park, but. It overlooks the southern Catskills, the eastern Catskills. You can see so much, even just right now with a view of the southern, a little bit of the western Catskills. And I am just going to be blown away by this. Uh, Matt, have you ever been there? I have not, no. And uh, do, are there views from the top even without the tower? Yes. Right now they, they have clear-cutted a little bit of or the tower. They have all the columns in there from the old previous fire tower that was that was decommissioned out in the seventies. I think it was 74. Lori Rankin was, was saying, and uh, they're going to be putting it up and it should be up the, by the spring summer. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, and uh, you know, I have a feeling this view is going to be absolutely stunning. I was looking at it through kind of like my peak finder app and you could see all the Northern Catskills part. And then you can see bear pen. You can see North Dome, Cheryl part of Hunter some of the blackheads, uh, Mount Pishka that used to have the Bobcat Ski Center on it, Slide yeah. Panther, Balsam, Balsam Lake, uh, uh, Double Top, Graham, and then a bunch of all those south- southern peaks of like Willow Emac, And I think you can see part of the reservoir. So it's going to be absolutely grand. So I suggest anybody, even right now, to go up there, take this nice little stroll, 3.8 miles. If you've done Catskill Peace, this is nothing for you. Oh, that's great. One side, one side's a fire tower road. The other side's a nice, regular Catskill hike of a little steepness here and there, a little bit of, you know, ter- bit of terrain. But uh, absolutely stunning. Check out my Instagram and, and my Facebook for a video on it. It's just absolutely phenomenal. I had a great time. Beautiful day, with, you know, no very little wind. About twenty thirty degrees uh, up top. No wind at all. But the frosted tips on the trees. Everything in the Southern Catskills was had that frosted top on it, and I was I was blown away by the beauty of of winter. I, I just I can't get enough of winter. I just love it. I do too. It's it is really beautiful. I mean, the starkness and the simplicity of it really just kind of make everything much more beautiful. Every, every little thing stands out more. Yeah. So excellent. Get out there, hike. Let me know what you did. I'll tag you in on the show. So once again, Matt, thank you once again. Uh, Catskill News Volunteer, 3500 Club, Catskill Trail Crew, Catskill Mountains Club, Visitor Center are, you know, ramping up their their summer, spring, and, and fall seasons. They're going to put calendars out soon for you guys to volunteer. Please volunteer. Matt's going to talk about a little, that a little bit tonight. Also, if you need stickers, free stickers from me, I will send them to you. Get a hold of me. I will send you stickers. Uh, go to Camp Catskill in Tannersville, and you can get stickers. So, Matt, I'm going to do a quick little recap of the weather forecast for this weekend. This might be out Saturday, so this will be out a little bit later. I won't get this out by tomorrow, so we're recording on Thursday night. But I got a little recap of the weather from Hudson Valley Weather. Alex, I just interviewed him last week, uh, and he did an awesome detailed forecast. Now, this keeps changing and changing. This, This forecast keeps going from... It might hit us. It might not. Uh, There is now a winter storm watch over the Hudson Valley area and up in the Ulster County and Sullivan County's area and more up towards the west as well to me. And they say 
This is 5 p.m. Thursday. Snow likely to develop near sunset on Saturday. Snow heavy at times Saturday night. Likely tapers off Sunday's afternoon. A snowfall over six inches possible across the region. So there's still uncertain certainty with this. And the timing and intensity is also uncertain as well. As we get closer to the weekend, you'll see. But keep an eye on that once again going out. Saturday, you'll be okay. But Sunday will be a little sketchy because the areas might not be plowed. Plus, the higher tops will have more snow. That means you're going to break trail. You're going to need your snowshoes. So snowshoes might be broken out this weekend, Matt. That sounds pretty cool. Sounds good to me. And I'm going to break out my skis and uh, get some tracks in if I can. Nice. Nice. That sounds fantastic. I think every everybody should caution yourselves on Sunday. But, you know, if, if, if everything's plowed, stuff like that, go local. Break out the trail with your snowshoes. If you haven't used snowshoes before, this would be a great time if you get a, a good amount of snow to break out your snowshoes and see how they feel. And maybe you work someplace that gives you a powder day um, on Monday. So you can just uh, take advantage of the, the nice fresh snow and the lack of people and ski around and snowshoe on Monday. Yeah. Use that PTO time that you, you deserve. <laughs> I'm looking at the, uh, the forecast and thinking I might do that myself. And just... Hell yeah. Please use that PTO. Ooh, definitely. Um, so Matt, we'll go over the last sponsors and then we'll get on to the uh, topic of the night, sir. Sounds good. All right. So uh, if you're ready to hit the trails, make sure you take the scenic route. Our scenic, our guides are here to help you with your goals, big or small, like Marcy or Slide or Lone the Stewards. Check out the scenic route guiding gear rentals on Instagram and Facebook for more information. Also, if you mention the podcast, you can get 10% off. Use the code Mountain Lion. Also, check out Another Summit, a nonprofit program that leads outdoor adventure activities for veterans and first responders for free. Activities like walking or hiking and even backpacking and paddling trip. Check out anothersummit.org for more information for dates and the future events. Now, is it time for new some new gear hiking in the Catskills? Say no more. Camp Catskill and Tannersville has all your hiking needs. Footwear, socks, moisture working shirts, freeze dried meals, micro spikes, Catskill merchandise, and more. They have all the essentials for your hiking needs. Located in Tannersville, and they have an online shop. Check out Camp Catskill. Also, if you want free stickers, stop at Camp Catskill. Check out all their local stuff they have amazing stuff especially t-shirts i love their t-shirts all right let's get on to the topic of the night let's go tonight we're going to talk about the 2023 highlights in the catskills with my friend matt smith and now matt is the advisor for the catskill trail crew correct i'm one of the co-founders of the catskill trail group with charlie gadoff yeah and matt's been on here several times and the catskill trail crew is something important that we need the Catskills, but Matt is also well knowledgeable about what's going on in the Catskills, is up to date on the Catskills. So I'd, I was like, hey, Matt, you want to join me for a recap of what happened in 2023? And Matt jumped right into it and was, was happy to do it. And I was just like, great, good. So we're going to talk about good old 2023 and uh, what happened in the Catskills. So welcome to the show, Matt. All right, Stash, good to be here. Always yeah. uh, fun to have some conversations about hiking in the Catskills. <laughs> Definitely is. Uh, we love the Catskills. So, uh, Matt, I mean, you've, you've given your background a couple times, but uh, go ahead and give a little bit of back background about your Catskill life. My Catskill life. Well, I was born in the Catskills, so I definitely uh, have a lot of uh, time spent on the ground uh, playing around the woods as a kid, Boy Scout and the System Forest Ranger, number of different roles um, with the trail crew. Uh, sorry, the trail conference over the years. Um, I started out with the New York, New Jersey trail conference as a trail maintainer. And then I started uh, working as a supervisor, helping other maintainers get their work done and, and report their hours and, and uh, get the conditions reported to the foresters. And over the last couple of years, I've been working with the Catskills trail group to try to take a different way of, of getting some some trail work done on the Catskills rather than individual maintainers taking whole crews of people out there spending a day with the more social environment and um, getting a lot more work done with with um, you know the help of other people and you guys have done a phenomenal job here in the Catskills uh, big huge impact impact in the, in the last year and a half two years I would say that has you guys have done a lot of stuff that is has transformed 
most of these these Catskill hikes that we have now. You know, you did part of the Mary Smith Trail, correct? Yeah, th- uh, that was a project that Cal Johnson and Charlie were really passionate about, and they, they, we did work uh, two years ago and also this year to be yeah, deal with the the muddy and overflowing areas on that yeah. uh, trail. So yeah, the, pr- amazing work, and I, I think people who saw the pictures online or have hiked that trail uh, can appreciate how much of an improvement it is, um, and you know how much better of a hiking experience it is with that and. You know, for the most part, it really looks fairly natural. It kind of blends in with the uh, the rest of the terrain. Um, interestingly enough, I think there we got some feedback from the the DEC that they want us to go back and and kind of pretty it up a little bit more. Like like they were not completely happy nice. with the uh, the the, uh, the work. Like they actually wanted us to cover up some of the uh, the rocks a little bit more. So they had some you know aesthetic concerns about the work and. Uh, so I think we need to go back and and keep working on that to kind of uh, bring it up to some of the standards that they set for for the type of work that that we're doing. Yeah, and I gotta admit, I had a, I had a great time going back there. It's it's definitely one of those trails that I wouldn't say you can't win on, but it, it's tough to 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 basically win on that trail because it's just so muddy, it's so worn in, and stuff like that. It's it's low below the the area of of north mountain that just keeps flowing and flowing it's a little bit of boggy area so you guys have done a phenomenal job on that and also you did a, a great amount of work on the, on the huckleberry trail correct the huckleberry loop trail was another big project this year yep so yeah i think they kind of had four big projects mary's glen trail was was one of renewy kill falls um was another one we did a big drainage project there for several days um, the Slide Mountain Water Bars was another big effort yeah. this year. Um, several days working there. Lots of people came out for that, made a really big impact. Um, and then the Huckleberry Loop uh, Trail was was one that we probably committed the most time to and maybe had the biggest impact. Um, and I think we learned a lot of lessons about like the type of work that we can do that has the biggest impact and that the DEC really wants us to do. And it, a lot of it has to do with resurrecting these trails that haven't been maintained as much as they might have been over the years. Like, you know, um, anybody who is a trail maintainer knows that sometimes it's tough to keep up with the overgrowth and you you can spend eight hours out there whacking away at at the branches and still the the trails just growing in on you. Um, And a lot of trail maintainers can get frustrated and they kind of give up after a while. And these trails then end up being unmaintained for years and um, don't get the TLC they need to kind of bring them back to the, the way they need to be. So that's what we did this year with, with Huckleberry Loop Trail. We spent about three to 400 hours of wow. time. Yeah, just um, I think eight separate trips, um, sometimes as many as six or seven people coming out and working with us, um, cutting blowdowns. We cut uh, close to 50 blowdowns. Um, on seven miles of trail, we, we cleared over seven miles of, of, uh, I think it was eight and a half miles that we did. We, we just finished a, another mile and a half, um, uh, from the uh, junction of the Huckleberry loop trail to the first few points on, on Drybrook Ridge. We started actually clearing the Drybrook Ridge trail as well, because after we finished the Huckleberry loop trail, the Huckleberry Ridge, or sorry, the, um, uh, Drybrook Ridge Trail started looking overgrown in comparison. So we started working <laughs> on that as well. I'll probably have another mile or so to do on that one to close the entire loop. So that's a great trail. And that, that the 13 mile loop in the Catskills is, is kind of a, um, a perfect length for like a, a challenging day hike or a great overnighter. And it's got super places to camp out and, and chill out. If you want to just like, you know, have a nice uh, sun bath in the middle of the summer on, on a boulder someplace out there, it's got nice fern glades and, meadows that that are kind of unique in the Catskills so that's a really uh, good trail um the the slide mountain trail is an interesting one because I've heard reports that all the water bars are filled up already that, wow you know, this, no way yeah well because every time it rains the uh, trail erodes and the rocks and the dirt just flow down the mountain and they just kind of start filling up those water bars and it kind of points out that a lot of the work that we've done is kind of fighting against some very elemental parts of nature, like erosion and water and mud. You know, these things are very difficult to control. And 
if, it's like somebody um, said a quote when we were working on a trail recently. It's like, if you, if you go and you play in the mud, you just get more mud. Like, and so, like, you know, sometimes, you know, True. approaching those projects of like trying to fix a mud pit, it's like, well, you're maybe just going to move the mud someplace else. Right. And um, who knows how long those repairs will last or whether or not the hydrology will change or whether or not a, a wet year will, you know, completely undo everything you've done. Those, those are tough projects. And, and interestingly enough, they're, they're projects that the DEC isn't really encouraging us to work on. So um, they've made it harder to do projects that require any kind of construction. So last year they introduced like a project management a uh, form that needed to be filled out and an assessment that needed to be done. And this was, a, you know, an attempt to put more control over the type of work that was being done. And that's a good thing. And this year, I think they, they required even more uh, details and it's, it's become very difficult to even kind of put together um, a project plan. And Charlie uh, spent quite a number of hours putting together some of these plans um, you know, the number of tools and how many you're going to be using, how many people are going to be there. Like, are there any potential for erosion going into streams, all, all sorts of things that need to be considered. And, you know, some of those projects didn't even get approved. So he spent hours, you know, writing them up, but then they decided that they were something that they wanted us to work on. So, so as we go into 2024, like any projects that require construction are probably going to be harder for us to get involved in. And so we're going to probably shift our focus to doing more of the trail maintenance and the remediation of those under maintained trails to try and open up the corridor, you know, blast away any kind of blowdowns or overgrowth that are, are overtaking some of the trails. Uh, in fact, we, we've identified about 10 miles of trail in the Western Catskills in the Willow Weemock area, nice. um, kind of the quick, quick lake and, and that area. So some of those don't have maintainers at all. And I'm making uh, a pitch that the Catskills trail crew can take on the long-term maintenance of these trails. So instead of having an individual maintainer named as the maintainer for these trails, that the Catskill trail crew will be the maintainer. The same way the Catskill 3500 Club maintains seven miles of trail over Plateau Mountain. Nice. I think we're going to take on the maintenance of these trails as a permanent uh, activity and that every year we'll go out and after we do this remediation and we open them up, we'll be able to go out one day a year. We'll bring a crew out and we'll just do a, a, a work day and, you know, we'll be able to get through several miles of trail and um, do it in a fun social environment, maybe with some patches and stickers and hats and t-shirts and buttons and all the other cool stuff that we have with our, we got a new logo this year. We, I designed oh. a new logo and, um, which uh, I'll, I'll send you some stickers so that you've got them and you can see it. It's um, kind of in honor of the work that we're doing to um, clip back the branches. It's, it's clippers rather than the, uh, our old logo with the uh, pickaxe and the shovel, which is, you know, that's some of the work we do, but we also do work that's a little bit more geared on corridor clearing. And so our new logo and our new patch will, will represent that. Excellent. You know, uh, don't send me that because I haven't I haven't been volunteering with you guys yet, so I don't deserve that. Oh, well, you've you uh, you know more than one volunteer has indicated that they heard about us from listening to your show. So I think you you are an honorary member, even if you haven't shown up. You've you've brought the the people to us, so uh, still you get, a, you get a patch. Yeah, still I'm I'm proud to have you guys here, and you guys really do help out the Catskills. Uh, way more than than you guys think or any other people think because just having that huckleberry point trail open up i mean i i gotta admit i love walking through those fern glades that are six feet tall but uh yeah. you know you know having that open and then having six foot feet tall walls on your side is a whole nother thing it feels like you're in a jungle out there it really is the, the, the um the ostrich ferns out there are yeah eight feet tall we have pictures of people who are being you know the ferns are towering over their head while we were working on them. So, yeah. And then once again, you, you said, and you also did stuff on Indian Head Mountain, I remember, and yeah. just your stuff on Slide. You guys have made a huge impact in the Catskills. Just imagine if that hasn't been done. You know, once again, the, the Huckleberry Trail would be neglected. The Mary's Glen Trail would be horribly muddy and stuff, you know. So, once again, yeah. thank you for you and Charlie for doing your work on, on the Catskills and the volunteers, importantly. Well, yeah, 
because yeah, Charlie and I are, are, you know, small part of the equation. We're the guys maybe planning some of this and, and doing some of the work to set it up. But yeah, the people who show up each time are the real heroes. I mean, there's a few people and I've named them before on the show and, and you know, uh, guys like Russ Hannaford who maintains a bunch of trail on his own and also came out, I think like a half dozen times, like he was, you know, a big person responsible for a lot of that work on, on the Huckleberry Loop Trail. He was out there almost every time we, we had a an event and, you know, he puts his back into it, gets the work done. So he's definitely a, a rock star in, in the community. Um, definitely somebody who can help us uh, continue to grow the crew into the future as well. Awesome. I can't wait to see what you guys come up with in, in 2024. So a lot of cool stuff. Uh, so let's keep, let's keep going on with the 2023 recap, recap, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus recap. Wow. I'm, I'm tired. Um, so some random highlights on, on the show and, and throughout the Catskills, uh, my friend Dylan, who, uh, hiked throughout the Catskills regularly, it was 3,500 or completed the Appalachian trail. So congratulations there, uh, oh. Dylan, that was episode 96. Awesome accomplishment. We had him on twice when he finished and when he was in the middle of the, the Appalachian trail, kind of almost directly in the middle when he was in Pennsylvania. So. Uh, and this is a through hike, not like section hiking at over yep. years. One hundred percent through hike. Wow, that's that's a big accomplishment, and I think it might even be harder these days because now you're competing for space and the shelters, and you know, it's um, a different type of challenge. I think maybe to, to hike it than it was years ago. It definitely, definitely is, and he, you know, talked about that, but he also talked about different topics of of camaraderie that he had on on the trail with people. You know, everybody just gets along and stuff like that. Did he get just, a trail name? He did. Creamsicle. Creamsicle, yeah. <laughs> I that that was definitely I'll, I'll have to look it up why he, he got it creamsicle. I'm I'm pretty sure I, I, he to me he should have been like like six pack or eight pack because he's got some abs of steel. It was crazy. <laughs> he was on two episodes, eighty four and ninety six, so Cool well, it's interesting. Maybe, maybe he bought a box of creamsicles and just downed them when he was in town. Because I've heard stories about people with voracious appetites coming off of the Appalachian Trail, just eating insane things and insane amounts of things. So um, who knows? Maybe he got that from lunching yeah. down. You know, maybe I'll I'll have to listen to to ninety or episode eighty or hold on eighty four. So eighty four and ninety six is when Dylan was on there. So I will have to listen to eighty four again and remind myself how he came up with the name creamsicle or somebody else yeah somebody else has to name you i think you can't give yourself a trail name if i'm not mistaken of, of course of course i don't have a trail name so uh, do you have a trail name yet i do it's matt, matt. It's, it's such a coincidence <laughs> yeah same here happened. stash <laughs> people say stash so i'm not i'm not like that so <laughs> bunch of books were released this year too uh on episode 93 beer hiking in new york with phil vondra uh that was a an, an interesting episode i, I gotta admit Hold beer on. hiking this is like hiking while you're drinking beer is it hiking to breweries uh what's the gist of that so jason friedman and phil, phil vondra made a book called beer hiking in new york state so it's basically talking about hikes right next to breweries and something to eat that you can go and uh right after you hike just have some some local brew and uh local nice. something to eat as well uh very cool very fun time of them and that was episode 93 and uh i gotta admit wow. they are they are an entertaining couple i would say <laughs> and uh phil set a, a record for the fastest known time in on the devil's path or no it wasn't the devil's path he did the fastest known time in the winter 35 so the 3500s in the winter he said a fastest known time so he oh, is yeah, really? an absolute beast so once again check out that episode uh 85 uh episode 85 was catskills trails by by uh, tom rankin so he released a new book that kind of like had his, his insight on the Catskill trails and you know a uh, really cool book if you want to get into the Catskills uh if you already know the Catskills still a good purchase have Tom sign it and stuff like that he's a cool dude edited and updated everything more accurate GPS points and uh 
a lot of updated stats on the hike. So if you're looking to get out, not just at the 3500 Club, but also a bunch of other different types of hikes, definitely check out 85 uh, that has Tom Rankin doing his Catskills Trail book that was also done by, I believe, Carol and, and David White, and he had revised it. So Carol and David White, legends of the Catskills. Yeah, and that's the ADK guide for the Catskills, right? Correct, correct. Definitely nice. correct. And then last chat about my stuff so we'll, we'll go on to some bigger episodes is one of my favorite episodes was episode 61 which was the bald eagle restoration project now i am a beautiful bird fan i love birds and my bald eagles are absolutely phenomenal matt you know you are older than me i hate to say that but um you remember <laughs> back in I love the 70s i am older than you <laughs> okay wiser than me let's say wiser too <laughs> I don't know so about that. We we both know back in the 80s, 90s, and, and stuff, the bald eagles were on the verge of extinction. And yeah. you know, I remember seeing down, you know, in Sydney, which is probably around 20 minutes away, there was a bald eagle nest that was kind of like a, a almost like a tourist trap. Everybody yeah. would go see it. And you know, i as a kid, I'd never want I always wondered why? Why what's so important about bald eagles? And then, you know, as I got older. I realized that bald eagles were on the verge of extinction up here in the the east coast and you know the only place they had them more was was alaska and over on the west coast and just hearing this bald eagle restoration project done by pete nye who has a passion for bald eagles and the dec and stuff like that was eye-opening and just heartwarming and everything and that was one of my favorite episodes uh practically yeah. ever just to hear how they did this you know to hear that they climbed up these these trees and took out the eggs from the eagles and put fake eggs up there so they can birth these eagles the proper way instead of them dying and fledge them and stuff like that it's just it's just absolutely phenomenal yeah and it's like it, you really see how noble humans can be when they have a commitment to do something for something other than themselves and like, that's, I think the most amazing thing you see, like a selfless act like that, like somebody trying to save a species and to bring them back from the brink of extinction is pretty, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got to say like, you know, I had the same experience. Like I, I was studying ornithology back in the early 1990s and I was in Sullivan County and we would drive down to one of the reservoirs where in the winter there would be, you know, a few bald eagles that would overwinter in the open water where they could fish. And it was just we would go and, and there was a, a viewing area and it was it was rare. It was a special area. And now I see them all over the place and I'm still thrilled. Like if I'm driving down right. the road and I see one flying over my car, I'm just like, you know, pumping my fist because it's just incredible to see just such a big, beautiful bird that and, you know, it is also like a pretty cool patriotic symbol for this country, too. So it's kind of you know, makes your heart swell with American pride. Every time you see a ball, yeah, it's right. like a, a Chevy commercial or something like that. It's like, wow, it's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. And just to, to see, I mean, a lot of people don't understand how massive bald eagles are, yeah. but their wingspan is absolutely insane. And like six feet typically, like, or yeah, six to eight feet total. Yeah. And yeah. just seeing these like, like bald eagles, you know, um, the friends of the feathered and furry do a lot of bald eagle uh yeah. projects because you know lead the containments of lead they get hit by you know unfortunately by a car i don't know how how that can happen but restoring these bald eagles, they're eating carrion they, they um kind of are taking the place of a lot of other birds um in and displacing crows and other animals in in you know urban areas and in suburban areas so yeah i think they're going to be more collisions with vehicles or, or, um, you know, interactions True. with humans in, in different ways. True. But, but, you know, seeing the DEC projects and, and these guys, uh, local volunteer organizations that help restore the wildlife, it's just absolutely phenomenal to see them release a bald eagle, you know, that was once on the verge of dying, flying back out into the open and tracking them and stuff like that. It's just, I don't know. It's, it's something else. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be a great um, life to, to do that, you know, and, and have that kind of um, involvement with, with, you know, saving other living things. 
right? And, and you know, episode check that out, episode 61 with Pete Nye, Bald Eagle Restoration Project. Awesome, oh. awesome episode. Also, check out uh episode 87, uh, the long path fastest known time. Kim Levinsky set the long path fastest known time. She went from north to south. And uh during that time, Matt, I don't know if you listened to that, but she had a rough time going yeah. during that time. She had rain, she had rain and more rain yeah. and different times. Did you have have you followed that her her time going through that? A little bit while she was doing it. I wasn't following it every day, but I, I recall seeing some updates on Facebook while she was while she was making progress. Yeah. She told a fantastic story. Episode 87 was her, her finish, and she was previously on there when she was uh, talking about uh, her thoughts about doing that beforehand so we could kind of get a little bit uh, that it was episode 71 so we could get a little bit of insight of her, her path and her projection on how long it would take and stuff like that. So she set it from south to, to or south to north. No, north to south. Sorry. My God, I'm getting stuff wrong again. Um, she sent it from north to south and she uh, did it in the fastest known time for the women's record. And she was and, supported though. She was supported. Yeah. So she she was supported. meeting her at crossings and providing food and aid. Um, as she went so she was kind of like almost like racing it in a sense not hiking it really per se or yeah um she had some some good good uh distances of where she she went unsupported but she did have support some of the time so it was yeah well there's some stretches there like going from phoenicia to um you know uh i guess napanok right you're you're going for close to 50 miles with maybe like one or two road crossings with absolutely no services. Like you're just out there in the wild and there's just no way to do it except for keep moving. Yeah. Same with like up North in the uh, Northern Catskills where you have absolute horrible trails and nettles galore and more of unmaintained stuff because then just out in the wild and you're just like, oh man. And she, she had some difficult times of where it just kept raining and raining. And then you got to worry about stuff like blisters and different things like that. So it's, it was a, it was a great story and uh congratulations, Kim. Yeah, that is great. Did she do it as like a fundraiser, like for the trail conference? She did actually. Well, uh, thank you for bringing that up. So uh Matt, give me one second. Good job. Uh, so she did do that as a, a support for the the New York New Jersey Trail Conference, as she is a, a big supporter of them, and I think she's yeah, might, right. might be on the board as well. Um, she's definitely quite involved and has been, you know, a force for good with the trail conference and all the things that she's doing. And I know she also runs a number of races as well. She has a series of races that she runs down yep. in the southern she, New York area. Yeah, she 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 does Sasquatch trail running, and. That's uh, right. And she was uh, just decided to take it uh, upon herself to to set the women's fastest known time. So, congratulations, cool. Kim! Uh, episode eighty seven. So check that out. Also, one of the big highlights of the twenty twenty three year was episode seventy four, where we, I talked to Jeremy Apgar about the New York, New Jersey, the new New York, New Jersey trail conference map. So oh, that yeah. was that was brought out. I gotta admit, Matt. The, the trail conference maps are the best in the country. I've never seen they anything better than this. outstanding. He is just an amazing cartographer. The work he does is just next level. Um, even, even you know, the, when you zoom in on the detail, it has everything you need and nothing extra. Like, it's just really yeah. well designed. And, you know, I, I just can't, you know, I've, I've, I've got Adirondack uh, maps. I have White Mountain maps. You know, I've had maps out, out west in, in southern utah and i i'm just like you guys need to get a hold of jeremy apgar you need to get a hold of the trail conference and adapt what they do because this is just absolutely blows everything else out of out of proportion and uh, i don't i don't know why or how just like you said the detail of when you can like zoom in on, on not your app but also the look at the viewpoints and, and the, the areas the the marked mileage and stuff they just do a phenomenal yeah. job. Jeremy does a phenomenal job. 
Yeah. Yeah. And these maps have evolved so well over the years. I, I have a, a set of maps from the 1980s uh, from the, the trail conference. And it's interesting that, you know, the, the trails that have um, been removed from the maps because, uh, you know, maybe the DEC or other people have suggested that they shouldn't be on there or new ones that have been added over the years. So it's, it's kind of cool that um, they're constantly evolving. They're always looking at the new data. They're responding to you know, land managers and yep. the things that are um, happening on, on the ground. You know, Jeremy does a great job of reaching out to the community and getting like field reports from, from different people who are out there, including them in his map. So it's, you know, really based on real world feet on the ground type of uh, an approach to, to map building. So yeah, kudos to him and, and the whole crew at the conference for, for the work they do. Yeah. And episode 74, he, he chats about it gratefully. And like you, like you said, boots on the ground, viewpoints specific locations he nails it each and every way and i i can't suggest anybody everybody and anybody needs a a, a paper trail conference map and you know the app on avenza uh it just blows my mind of how good it is compared to other maps like you know i went up and did marcy on my birthday last year and i got a, a adirondack map and i'm just like jesus i can barely read most of this like I know it's a lot, lot bigger, but this was more of the specific area to the lodge and to the the great range and stuff like that. And I was just like, "Wow, this is this is tough to read." Yeah, the um, the National Geographic maps are kind of very popular, but I find them substandard compared to the ones from the Turf Trail Conference. They're just messy and just like they're trying to put too much information. The the colors don't work. They're they, you know the topographical lines you know are confusing and, and create um you know visual disturbance so right? yeah not not nearly as nice thank you man at least somebody else agrees with me so <laughs> well you know there used to be maps in the catskills there were the venture out maps i don't know if you ever heard of those but like old time catskill people will remember the the venture out maps and you can still find them occasionally on ebay people sell them for ridiculous prices um, I picked up a, a second copy um, a couple of years ago because my original one was just all torn up. And but they were just amazing, uh, an amazing map. It was a big, giant, two-sided map of the Catskills. I think it came out probably in the 80s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, maybe it was updated into the 90s, possibly. But it had like just an, an intense amount of detail, like but was fairly well designed. And at the time, it was kind of brown, uh, groundbreaking. Um, there were, you know, old woods roads on the side of Eagle Mountain and other uh, places that, you know, wow. um, you just don't really see on any maps, but that were well defined on that one. So um, maybe someday I'll, I'll uh, hook you up with a copy of the Venture Out map and, and uh, you have a little piece of Catskill history. I'm interested whether or not any of your other guests will remember or have used um, Venture Out maps over the years. I'll have to reach out to me if you have, so uh, Matt can me and Matt can take a look at what those those ones were. I I have no clue of what Matt's talking about. Matt does, so I'm I'm actually excited. I actually Googled that, and they they don't have much on the venture out maps. No, so. I I don't think they were like that uh, popular, but um... interesting. I'll have to definitely check it out. So excellent. Once again, uh, episode seventy four, New York, New Jersey Trail Conference map with Jeremy Apgar. That was great. Also, uh, a really good one uh, that we'll talk about real quickly is episode 89. I did a fastest snow time set by Joshua Reed. He did it in like, God, I think it was like three hours and 54 minutes or something like that. Absolutely insane. I I, I can't even fathom doing a, a full trail in, in three hours, let alone 24 miles. So uh, that was a very interesting episode because he also talked about the escarpment run. Uh, which is a very popular, amazing hike that's been going on for 50 years here in the Catskills, which uh, I had no clue about, but uh, I had a clue Dick about Vincent's the race. Yeah. yeah, Dick Vincent's rates that uh, I I knew it existed, but I didn't know it existed for over 50 years. It's a, it's a legend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so definitely check that out. But one thing we wanted to dive into uh, and I wanted to get Matt's perspective definitely about this because it's going to be coming out soon. They're going to be bringing this out is the Catterskill Clove VUM plan, visitor use management. Yeah. Now, this is a big deal 
in the Catskills because mm-hmm. we we have never gotten something like this before, except for like kind of like the Peekamoo's Blue Hole, but that was kind of just implemented really quickly. This is actually a study that they've been doing for over a year and a half, I believe, maybe a year. And in 2024, the spring of 24, they they should be coming out with with the information that they gathered from their their data. So uh, that was episode 79, and this is definitely a big project here in the Catskills. I think it's yeah. it's it's going to be definitely crazy. Well, parts parts of it are already really being implemented, right? I mean, so they did some initial containment after the pandemic when things just went completely bonkers um and you know people were parking everywhere so yeah. they've, they've essentially eliminated all parking anywhere from the very top to the bottom so from haynes falls to palinville there's no parking on 23a anymore so all those little pull-offs where people used to park nothing like completely shut down um, and they have shuttles now they actually have a shuttle that runs up and down and will take you and drop you off at various points i think the trailhead at the falls and other legit places that that you might have access which i think maybe that's the only one that i'm aware of so yeah so things are happening there and they are controlling access and i think that's what it's all about is controlling access you don't want to remove access yeah. but you want to make sure that just it isn't just unfettered and you know i think you pointed out the blue hole is a good example of where they controlled the access to that area and they continue to control it and narrow the focus of that area um, to make it easier to control because ultimately, you know, it's just a wide open area and anybody can just walk in there. Right. So now you got fencing and all sorts of other things that really have completely changed the character of it. I mean, it's like, I, I, I'm unsettled by the whole thing at the blue hole. Personally, I understand why it happened. I mean, it was disgusting and the, the kind of behavior that happened prior to the, the, remediation that they did was, was just the worst aspects of humanity on display um in you know the the worst possible way just you know human waste and um debris scattered about like like just like a pigsty yeah, i mean it's just it's just awful uh, absolutely awful and i realize that you know people will make arguments as to the cultural aspects of why people do that and it's just the the bottom line is there's no place for it here and and the catskills can't survive that type of um negative impact um consistently but I got to tell you, you know, that was a place where I went to high school in Boysville, and that's, you know, probably 10 miles away from the Blue Hole. And after cross country practice, we went to the Blue Hole to go swimming, you know. So this was just a place in the neighborhood that you could go that was like just another good swimming hole in the Catskills. How it caught on the way it did and became like this infection on the land, like people showing up like a blight like 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 a virus and, and just destroying this place like i i'm fascinated by how that happens honestly because i i you know humanity is is just a really interesting um thing you know where where we destroy the things we love in in ways that are just um counterintuitive like why why how would you like want to go to a place that's a beautiful nat- natural place and then trash it yeah. while you're there like how like how do those impulses both occur in somebody's brain at the same time? I, I truly don't understand that. I know that psychologists have done studies about cognitive dissonance and the ability to hold, you know, competing and contradictory thoughts in your head at the same time and all the psychology that goes along with that. But man, it's, I, you know, it's sad that, you know, we have to lock it down and put nature in a cage to keep it away from the people. Like that's kind of where we are right now with with um, certain parts of, of the Catskills, but um, and I, I got to hand it to the DEC. They they've done a good job of controlling it. I mean, it's not without cost, right? All the rangers there patrolling the Blue Hole are not patrolling someplace else. You know, there's there's a there's a cost to focusing all of the resources on protecting one popular area so that all the other areas don't get protected, and so you'll end up with fire rings and problems other places until they can staff up and. And, you know, take care of the things that they need to. Yeah. We're, you know, we live in it's such an incredibly rich state. It boggles the mind how there isn't just tons of money to do whatever needs to be done in the Catskills whenever it needs to be done. I don't think it necessarily money or lack thereof is, is the problem. I, I, the DEC is able to respond 
really quickly to whatever they want to, when they want to. Perfect example, there's there's a wildlife management area near where I live, the Noodle Town Wildlife Management Area. Probably never heard of it, but after the recent storms, somehow the DEC got in there and repaired the roads in there like two weeks after the storm. Like they had a brand new road put in there with culverts. And this is a, like, it's not even an open road. Like this is an access road that wow. nobody but the DEC uses to access the middle of this wildlife management area. And that was the first thing that they did. So somehow they had the funding and the people necessary to go do that. But how do we not solve the problems in the Catskills and other places that are just so fundamental and so like obvious, like it's just, you know, the things that are happening, people been talking about for years. Like, so the the slow response i think is just um maybe something that will get better with time you know i think that we hear there's more money being injected into the dec to make them more nimble and responsive and um you know the foresters are really dedicated to doing good work and i think if they have the um the, the staff and the resources to do what they need to do i think um things will continue to get better um you know i think there's a lot of people who are focusing on making the cat skills a sustainable resource that will both benefit the local communities and be a great natural resource for tourism and, and, you know, bring some money and some attention to the region. Yeah. It's definitely going to be tough down in the Catasco Clove because it's such a, like, like the blue hole, it's such a narrow area and it's such a, a long stretch of narrow area that has hold such beauty in the Catskills. That is, you know, one of the most recognizable place in the Catskills, of course, with the Catasco Falls and of course, with the old mountain house and there, and the old, you know, hotels that they had there, that was the the first place that they ventured up to uh, to go. Like people used to go for for recreation, really. Okay. So now, it's now we have to, orchard. yeah, the, the Orchard Point or not? Yeah, High Orchard used to be the town name that it used to have there because of the mountain house and and the and the Catterskill Hotel. So. And now, unfortunately, due to overuse and stuff, you know, we can probably blame social media for that, of course, but I don't blame them because Catterskill Falls is absolutely stunning. And I would go see that as many times as I can because it's beautiful. Um, that area well, and, and, is just phenomenal. The escarpment trail and, is absolutely amazing. But the DC has really built up that area. It's basically a road walking into Catterskill falls now like if you start at the uh the uh, you know the visitor center you know you're following a, a cinder road in there you've got you know staircases stone staircases leading down so the whole thing has been really hardened and made so that it could withstand the traffic that's showing up there so it's been thoughtfully designed and well built to um serve the community and i think that it serves as an example of what needs to happen all over the Catskills in, in to different degrees, right? I mean, we're yeah. talking about Slide Mountain and, you know, we have this old Jeep road that heads right up Slide Mountain. It's just eroding and just turns into a, um, you know, a stream every time it rains. Like, how can we make that more sustainable? Like, how could the DEC rebuild that trail to make it so that those water bars don't fill up every time it rains um you know because water bars are you know when you were putting water bars in you know that you're you've you got a problem right your trail sucks and yeah. you're just trying to like fight against erosion and it's like a losing battle at the end of the day i mean water wins every single time like you're never going to win when water is trying to wear your trail down so i mean you can i've seen some of the most well-built stone staircases that were just torn apart after a big storm. I mean, you know, the bottom half of them just screws ripped out and then the stairs start falling apart. So the, the staircase you thought was going to last a hundred years, one big storm and it's gone. So, yeah. you know, these, it's, it's, you know, you gotta really invest in a uh, back country infrastructure. I think, you know, we kind of have random trails in the Catskills. I mean, um, the old trails just were wherever somebody hiked, they went through mud pits and wherever, and, and just kind of that's what have were marked and maintained over the years. Um, you compare those to some of the new trails that have been built. You know, I think the um, Red Hill Fire Tower Trail is a fairly new trail that was put in. And that's an example of where it's got switchbacks and, um, you know, the proper grading. And it's got, um, you know, benching so that the water sort of naturally flows off of it. And it's got, you know, rolling contours so that it's never just going straight up one section. Um, and when it exceeds a certain grade, it has 
steps put in so that you know it, it um, holds the, the earth in place so it's got all of these elements that are really well thought out and really planned and let's just keep doing that like there's like 350 miles more worth of trail and probably a hundred of them could use that type of remediation think about all the popular trails that you know are just you know falling apart and you know are roots and rocks and and um, slippery and you don't want to remove the challenge but you also don't want people to be struggling and, and creating more problems you know and, and avoiding the um the tricky part and then you know walking through the side of the trail right because maybe the middle of the trail is filled with ice or um something because it isn't properly drained and now they're they're trampling along the vegetation on the side of the trail to avoid the amount of the ice so all these things have you know uh, duplicative effects you know and, and they keep having um you know deterioration of, of the trail so let's you know hope that you know more of our tax dollars get diverted to hiring professional trail crews and and you know funding the kind of remedial work that's going on um have you heard much about the um the, the advisory boards the catskill advisory boards that are have been formed over the past couple of years and that were tasked with making some decisions about how various plans like the uh Catterscope clove visitor, visitor use management plan would um being like, rolled out. Are you talking about like CPAC and stuff like that? Yeah. And, and there, I think there were some additional committees that were spawned out of CPAC that were meant to specifically deal with some of these short term issues that, that, um, that we're talking about now. I, I haven't heard fully about that, but you know, I'm, I'm very, very curious about, uh, OTAX like research that they're going to do and, and what they, cause they've done some fantastic stuff, you know, based upon, what I've read and what, what they've, they've talked about and chatted about, you know, with the Arches National Park and Acadia and stuff. I'm, I'm very curious of what this tight little area that has, you know, room for improvement, but very like limited access room for improvement. It's, it's going to be difficult. And I'm very, very curious of what they come up with and stuff. Well, in terms of managing the trail list peaks you're talking about? No, no, I'm talking about the clove area. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's definitely gonna, you know, it should it, they, they I think they had a, a a draft that said they would would come out with, with project thoughts in twenty twenty four, spring of twenty twenty four. It's coming out soon. Yeah, and it's gonna be interesting because I, I don't know like what are the options, right? Are they gonna build yeah, more right. trails like in, in the clove? I mean it's it's a highway that runs up through there. So I mean it's it's you know kind of a department of transportation problem to some degree, right? I mean how do they are they gonna maybe create pull offs so that people can stop and you know take pictures and um, you know kind of enjoy the view along the way? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, or mm -hmm. maybe have those viewpoints where, you know tour buses or um you know shuttles can pull off and, and provide access um it's not really easy to you know hike from route 23 up into the north lake area there aren't really natural easy trails that that could be formed there so so yeah i don't know it'll be interesting to see what what additional things that they could do to, to improve access or create more yeah. recreational opportunities there yeah should be coming out soon so once again i i talked with otec uh i I forgot her name. Uh, I talked with Abby Larkin of OTAC on episode 79 about that, and uh, she brought some good use of information, and I'm I'm excited to see the information that they've brought out uh, on the visitor units management plan because it's definitely a tough area. Uh, once again, just like the blue hole and stuff. I'm um, speaking yeah. of the blue hole, Matt. Uh, let's have you read, of course, probably have of the Pecamus uh, units management plan that they released. I did not read it. No. So, are there any highlights that are interesting? Actually, they've they've started on most of the the unit management plan down in the Sundown Wild Forest. So, they had a small parking lot, and now we have a. They took. I think they took away the old campgrounds that were near one of the creeks and made an eighty car parking lot. Yeah, I did hear about them removing the primitive camping eighty car parking lot. Huh. Yeah. That's a little bit further down uh, towards the west, I believe, of of Route 42. Or is it Route 42? Or, or it just... is Route 42. Yeah. Okay, good. I don't even know how 42 cars are going to get down Route 42, or 80 cars <laughs> are going to get down Route 42, because um, it's, yeah, it's just not a very 
big road. So, I mean, they're kind of, in a sense, creating a, a demand that's going to probably require the road to be improved at some point in the future. I don't know. It's, um, yeah, that was one of the, the things, uh, the closure of eight parking areas. So that's, uh, I believe, east of the Blue Hole, there's a bunch of parking areas that are closed down and, and are kind of boarded off. And these include like just little single pull offs and stuff like that for two cars and stuff. I wouldn't call them parking areas, but some of us, like you and me, like to bushwhack upon that area and go up these streams and stuff like that. So that'll be, yeah, that'll be interesting. Um, well, so then, and it's interesting. So they're gonna they're gonna get rid of those parking areas. So then you're gonna have people walking along the side of the road, which has no shoulder and is super narrow. And then you so say, you know, maybe you're gonna have pedestrian um safety issues unless they you know control speed or create some kind of a um clear hiking zone along there because as you pointed out people are going to want to walk to buttermilk falls yeah. and all these other areas and if they can't pull off they're going to be walking from the 80 car parking lot you know strolling along the road um while cars are driving around this narrow windy little stream road so yeah, it's um, not an easy area to maintain. I, I don't um, envy the job of the land managers who have to make sense of, of all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely difficult to think about because just this, some of this stuff, like uh, with the 80-car parking lot, they're going to do a six a 0.6-mile tr connector trail to the Pika Moose blue, blue Hole. And that, yeah. that'll also add a construction of a 60-foot bridge across Bear Hole Brook. Uh and Bear Hole Brook is, yeah, that's 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 a crazy little area because when that gets area Bear Hole Brook, when that gets flooding, that gets a huge torrent. So, yeah, it does get cooking. That's a really long uh, drainage when you look at it on a map between it's, like uh, what is it, uh, Stone Cabin Brook and Bear Hole Brook. Both of them are big drainages. Yeah, and that goes straight from the uh, the call of like Peekamoos and uh, Table. So, two extremely steep mountains on the side draining that so that that'll be interesting uh there is um, also they were able to get a uh, so they're able to get uh, approval for putting a, a bridge over that stream that's it's not not easy to do so i guess they they had that written into the plan yeah um and then there's also a footbridge and a retaining wall near the wooded pathway entrance to the blue hole uh, of the roundout creek in the pika moose road so and so how do you get to the uh, the peak of moose trailhead from there right you got to park in that 80 parking 80 car parking lot and, and hike to the peak of moose trailhead too right correct I, I believe also you can park right by the the peak of moose uh a trail that's what we call it i don't, I don't i've never called oh, it the blue are they the blue. keeping that parking lot open i believe so i always thought i oh, i'd wow. never heard the closure of that one okay i thought that when you said they were closing them i thought that might have been one of the ones that they were closing uh, I don't think they they're going to close that one because it's 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 right access with the Pika Moose Trailhead for us for the hikers instead of just I wouldn't say the, the tourists but the tourist people. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that's going to be interesting to see how that evolves. Yeah. It's uh, it's become a real focus point for sure. I mean, and what's interesting is there's absolutely no services anywhere around that. Like you know, the closest store is what like probably ten miles in any direction. Oh God! So once yeah. You're in there, on your own yep definitely and there's absolutely no service because you're in between bangle hill and, and peekamoose and the area is yeah. just an absolute call shaped area that that just flows water and stuff so it's definitely yeah. a, a a different draft of plans and stuff like that and i haven't i haven't had anybody to talk about that because of course that's dec and it's tough to get information from and uh yeah, yeah to talk about that you know is it's definitely difficult but i just wanted to, to inform people uh when you go down there of course you need you still need a permit i don't think you need a permit in the winter months but you definitely need a permit in the spring and summer months when they start implementing that that permit system and is there again, a fee for that permit is it a, uh, like was a, there i'm pretty sure it was like five dollars but i thought too yeah uh i remember i i did it a while back i went up bengal hill with my nephew and stuff uh and uh that's an awesome hike and we we met absolutely no one up there oh, of course yeah ten dollar permit ten dollars now yeah ten dollars per vehicle i guess right yeah so just imagine i think there was so, seven so, a limit of 75 vehicles per day 
So do you think that there's people who would not be able to go because they don't want to pay the $10? Like this is not in their budget to pay $10 to go hiking I, or something? I believe so. And I, I believe that there's people that also don't are not aware of that. Um, oh, yeah. And I, and I don't know if they, they I know that you can play it, pay it on the fly because, you know, if there's not, it says actually right now for, for this on the DEC site that there's only 50 limits per, per day. So um, I have a feeling that's going to change. This is actually, so, so it's definitely. I wonder uh, how the blue hole is going to change over the time because blue hole is not the same blue hole it was 20 years ago. I mean, storms have really changed it and it changes, you know, con consistently every winter. Right. And so you know, every time there's a big storm, some, you know, debris and, um, sediment gets shifted around and you know things you know tend to change a lot so you know some years the blue hole is going to be better than other years yeah and i wonder whether or not that's gonna like change the the traffic over time yeah it could it could who knows who knows what what's going to happen in 10 years you know i gotta admit when i was hiking this uh Oh, Pika Moose, I forgot how many years I hiked that, probably like like seven, eight years ago. There was nobody there. I could find a parking spot on the weekend easily. And now, you know, you got to get a permit. So it's it's crazy what's changed in, in eight years. And you know what the fine is if you don't have a permit? Actually, no, I don't. I'm guessing $250. I, I, $250. Wow. Yep. Yeah. And the ranger yeah. will come and slap it on you right there. And you got to pay it. Yikes. Like, it's like getting a uh, traffic ticket so it goes on your registration oh wow so uh so yeah every everybody who wants to hike peak was table go ahead and go from denning if you don't have a permit <laughs> <laughs> or bushwhack up it uh through oh that's a tough hike through the moon haw or something like that that's tough i don't know that's yeah there's a lot of easy ways to get in there one one peak that i've got on my to-do list pretty soon is van wick i want to get up there I haven't been there in years that's phenomenal. I I haven't been there, like I said, in, like you said, in years. So it's uh, it's it's a great hike, but that's that's one that's going to require a, a permit because that that little corridor, you have to park down at the lower parking area or at the regular parking area. So, yeah, pretty much if you're going to take the old woods roads up the shoulder of Van Wick, you pretty much start right there at uh, the Stone Cabin Brook in that area. Yeah. So once again. Crazy stuff coming to the Catskills. Uh, crazy stuff coming all over the United States. So it's not just us. Just don't think that it's just the Catskills. Adirondacks everywhere is going through some major changes. So, Matt, let's talk about our, our last kind of topic of, of the night. Uh, the chair bandits that you had to uh, <laughs> kind of interact with. Uh, that was episode 86 that we chatted about that. But you want to give a little recap of what happened on that day? It was a really interesting day. Yeah, there was a, we were doing the trail crew work on the water bars on Slide Mountain, and we saw a fellow hiking up the trail with um, wood on his back. And then we realized his whole family was carrying wood. And, and at first, we didn't realize that it was parts of a chair. But as they got closer, it became obvious it was you know the back and and the arms and the legs. And when we asked them what they were doing, they they unabashedly told us they were going up to the top of slide to set up these chairs and they didn't want to hear anything about leave no trace or any other um, ideas that, that might've dissuaded them from, from carrying out their mission. So it turns out like we were able to relay some information down to the trailhead stewards. The 3,500 club had trailhead stewards on, on the, uh, the job that day. And some of our crew was leaving early. So we asked them to pass the message to the, uh, the stewards about what was going on and the stewards took action and, and they um, remembered seeing these folks didn't know what was going on, but they remember which car they drove. So they took pictures of, of the license plate, got the vehicle information. Um, and some of their friends had come down the mountain and actually gotten pictures of the chair bandits on the summit. Um, so they asked their friends to stay behind so they could provide evidence to the Rangers when they arrived. And eventually the Rangers did show up on, on their standard patrol and, and the information was provided to them. At which point they went up and um, started to hike up the trail, but the, but the chair bandits a appeared shortly after with without any chairs and were questioned by the rangers as to what was going on. Um, and at first, I think they were denying any involvement in it, but eventually they were 
presented with evidence of them doing the deed on, on the summit and, and um, some other um, people who had witnessed what they were doing um, spoke up. And so they, they eventually did admit that they left the chairs up there and the brain jury, I think, gave them an opportunity to go up and take the chairs down uh, to avoid getting fined. And they declined that offer and were fined for littering and a number of other violations, if I'm not mistaken. And I think at that point, the uh, the ranger and one of the um, summit stewards from the trail conference uh, dismantled the chairs and were able to carry them out the same day. So no real lasting impact or negative um, impacts on, on the mountains. But it's definitely one of those lessons where you realize that people have very different perspectives on things. And sometimes, you know, you think you're just doing the, the right thing and, and like the thing that everybody wants you to do. And, and then, you know, maybe you realize at a certain point it isn't <laughs> what everybody wants you to do. And, and, you know, I think just uh, a good lesson being sensitive and listening to the people who maybe know more about you out there. Cause they, they were warned about what they were doing and, and they decided to proceed you know, with, with their mission, despite being um, advised that, that they may be ticketed and, you know, all the things that happened to them, they, we told them like, you, you're going to get a ticket from the Rangers because we're going to tell them on you. Um, they decided to do it anyway. And you, you know, I hope that, you know, there's some reflection afterwards and that other people maybe who heard about the story kind of realized that, you know, maybe when you're doing these type of things, you got to stop and think for a second or maybe ask and, you know, figure out whether or not what you think is a good idea actually is a good idea for the entire community. Cause it's not, you know, when you do something out there on public lands, it's not just about you anymore. It's about everybody else who visits that. So you got to take everybody else's needs and, and um, perspectives in, into consideration. Yeah. And you know, that was uh, a, a crazy time that we had. And I, I, I once again, I, I talked with the Rangers about that and they had to carry those, those down, uh, by backpack you know they couldn't disassemble them because they had some certain sort of hexagon screws in them that they didn't have the, the utilities for yeah yeah they couldn't they had to carry them down fully developed so you um, put like security screws on there to make it so they couldn't be dismantled he did so uh ranger martin was was on that and i had a discussion with him about that and wow. yeah it was uh it was definitely some eye-opening event because he said you know we we wanted to disassemble them and take them down piece by piece to make it easier and of course they couldn't because they had some those hexagon screws in there so i mean not to say they they didn't think about that but they sort of did and 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 it sucks you know and once again people are like ah oh, you know that wouldn't be bad to have up there but you know one person does it and then that starts a whole nother show and i i hate to say another shit show that there'll be chairs up there people will leave trash up there people will leave you know their their regular chairs that they sit at at soccer uh games up there and and it will not be not be fun you know it won't be it won't be that that kind of place you're going to adventure to to get away from things you'll just see things that you normally see every day yeah. Yeah. I mean, there used to be, um, you know, a tower and lean twos and all sorts of structures up on top of slide mountain, but yeah, it's done a pretty good job of growing back and, and healing itself. And the last thing we need is for it to start going back in the other direction of, of abuse and overuse. So yeah, hopefully, uh, no more chair bandits Yeah, and no more people with speakers either. That's, uh, something that's becoming more frequent on the trails and uh you know people who are listening to music in the middle of the wilderness this it's a phenomenon that you know 10 years ago i would have never thought it would happen but you know it's um it's almost ubiquitous I, it's i whenever i go hiking now i hear somebody listening to music out of a bluetooth speaker wow um, yeah. so do, you, do you experience that have you ever seen that on the trails I experienced that once and that was a long time ago. That was like, huh, like 2017, I believe. And I, okay. I'm like, you know, luckily the people I've run into have had Bluetooth headphones and stuff. So it's, it's actually, I've never experienced except for that one time. And that was of course, one of the most popular trails going up to North mountain. So <laughs> I, I think um, I've had bad luck because it's uh, this, this year, four or five times I've been on the trails and I've heard people with Bluetooth speakers. Yeah, maybe it's because I don't hike on the weekends. That could be, yeah. That's a blessing. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I'll change my schedule. 
Yeah, but then you won't have volunteers to help you guys out in the trails. So, so don't I'll, take I'll your... do my fun hikes on the, uh, the the weekdays, and I'll do my work on the trails on the weekends. <laughs> yeah, so crazy uh, incidents happening, and uh, we 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 talked about that on episode eighty six. And then once again, I also ch- chatted uh, with the Rangers, I believe, on episode ninety six with them uh, about that. The Ranger Martin, who had his own first iron weight, that was uh, Ranger or ninety four was Ranger Slade and Ranger Martin, two uh, important guys in the Catskills that that really help out the Catskills, and you know that I'm uh, sort of friends with. I chat with oftenly, and they are great, phenomenal people. And once again, one of those crazy events that we had that you just you just can't really think that's going to happen on your way up to a mountain and then it does so matt had a first hand experience of that and it was just a, an amazing chat to have uh about that so i'm glad i'm glad number one i'm glad you were up there matt to give them sort of kind of like insight of what they should do but uh, of course they they ignored that yeah, well, I think maybe I'll, I learned a lesson. I'm going to get better at at uh, my leave no trace uh, banter, so I can maybe be more convincing. Uh, so the next chair bandits I run into, maybe I'll be able to convince them to to not do the deed. <laughs> hey, we, we all we all learn. We all learn in the mountains. So, um, so Matt, uh, thank you for joining me for a recap of 2023. You know, I know uh, most of these topics you you weren't firsthand involved with, with but i'm glad you you got to share your insight about the cat skills and uh you, the topics that i i chatted about and that i covered in 2023 and I, I hope i hope you had a great year in 2023 i know the trail crew did some amazing stuff and i'm very proud to have you guys in the cat skills yeah thank you yeah and you've been a great supporter and getting the word out bringing volunteers to us and yeah 2023 was great 2024 is going to be an even better year for us we've got more plan and we've got more momentum and um the the trail conference is doing a great job their volunteer office is really coming together they've got some folks who are um doing a great job of recruiting people we're going to be working with um some church groups and some other groups from from the new york city area bringing them up to do some work with us and uh, maybe doing some trail camps uh, multiple days camping out and um you know bringing people out in the back country kind of showing them a different perspective not just the work part of it but some some fun stuff as well absolutely phenomenal that is is what i love to hear and that's what we need more of uh getting you maybe you know youth organizations up here and getting them inspired yeah. to help out in the catskills or getting people exactly. that would never step foot up here in the catskills and getting them to fall in love with them and yeah you know that's what i'm all about is is to get people in love with the catskills and to do what we do leave no trace you know provide that educational and informational experience that they'll be like oh I understand now. I understand why this little section of sugar loaf is absolutely stunning because nobody leaves trash up here and you follow that straight line, you leave no trace. And you know, that's 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 why we're here. That's why people like you and me and, and other people, most of the people that I've had on the show are here to pass on that education that'll make them fall in love with the Catskills and respect the Catskills like me and you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, be good citizens of the forest and bring good energy and and um, contribute to the overall community. So yeah, yeah. there's a lot of good energy going on in the Catskills. It's a beautiful place, and look forward to spending more time and and uh, maybe getting out and doing some hiking with you sometime. Yes, I will be. When when did you, do you know when your calendar is going to come out for for volunteering? Do you have a, any thought? I think we're going to probably put our calendar out around March. Um, Charlie are going to go out over the next couple of months and we're going to scout out the trails, figure out where the, the problem areas are, where we got to focus on, kind of estimate the number of days of work. And then we're going to put our calendar together and start recruiting folks and bringing some additional leaders onto the crew this year. Hopefully we can get some additional folks to, to help lead and, and um, spread our influence out further and wider across the whole park. Awesome. Awesome. I will that plugged into my show as much as i can and uh thank you once again uh for supporting the show and thank you for your, your generous donation of of hard ciders i really appreciate it yeah i'm sure you'll do uh good things with it and stasha <laughs> appreciate you and your show and and uh all the great work you do to get the word out about the, the good stuff going on the cat skills thanks again for having me on yeah yeah uh so last question post hike bruise and bright so what do you want to uh, suggest for people to get something to eat or something to drink after a good hike in the cat skills 
Hmm. Interesting. Well, I think last time I, I mentioned Stewart's because I love going <laughs> and getting chili and a milkshake after a hike. And I got to say, I have a hard time beating that. And there's Stewart's everywhere. So no matter where you go, there's pretty much a Stewart's there and you get like a chocolate milkshake. And I'm a fan of their chili personally, but, um, you know, you can get like a, a, a bowl full of meatballs there. Like where else can you go and just get a bowl full <laughs> of meatballs? I mean, it's pretty awesome. So yeah, it's like lots of protein, delicious. So I, I highly recommend Stewart's meatballs. Awesome. Let's so let's hope they hear the word. And then, uh, whoever the <laughs> owner of a Stewart's or the, the CEO listens, this is like, Oh man, let's, uh, let's get on oh. that show. <laughs> it's a great maybe we'll ask them to sponsor the trail crew we could bring out like a vat of meatballs for for the trail crew on on uh an event you know we can meatball subs for everybody to eat i don't know it's um oh, man that sounds good maybe some, some action to work on there that'll bring a lot of people out catskill trail crew sponsored by stewards i think this is a new thing that we're going to work on so see how it goes gotta get that out there so uh <laughs> so once again matt thank you for joining uh, me on the show I would like to also thank the monthly supporters and the sponsors for the show. Really appreciate you guys supporting and helping me out in the show because uh, it's, it's, I gotta admit it's, it's tough to do this weekly and uh, keeping up with it is, is, is a dedication that I love to do though. I, I love the cat skills and I do this all the time. So um, also thank you to anyone who has donated to the show. Really appreciate it. And I, I really especially appreciate that everyone who is listening still to the show after 107 episodes it's been a fantastic time and i'm i got the momentum going and i'm I'm still going to keep doing this so uh matt thank you once again for joining on the show for like the fifth time i believe i really appreciate your insight <laughs> in the cat skills and i appreciate the dedication you have to the cat skills uh it's really inspiring thanks dosh yeah and it's um likewise i'm, I'm uh, always impressed by the uh, the energy that you bring to the cat skills and and to the hiking community and uh, look forward to episode 200 maybe uh coming up pretty soon hope so hope so so uh have a good night and uh hopefully see you soon man all right thanks Sash. yep take care bye. bye hey everyone i just want to thank you for listening to the show if you enjoyed the show, subscribe and throw down a smooth review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any podcast platform that you use. You can also check daily updates of the podcast, hikes, hiking news, and local news on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the official website of the show. Remember this, you gotta just keep on living in the cat skills, man. L-I-V-I-N Wicked, 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 